Hey time machine travelers, today we're going to take some notes on European exploration. So make sure and title your notebook as that and you can do this digitally or in your actual notebook either way as long as you have the notes it doesn't matter to me. If I'm going too fast in the video make sure and pause it so that you can catch up and get what I'm saying. So here we go with some context. We're starting in unit 4 which starts around 1450 and we know in 1492 Christopher Columbus discovers, and I put that in quotations because he didn't actually discover anything. We know there were already Native Americans there, but he's given credit for finding the New World because the Europeans didn't know that it was there. And so basically what you need to put down for this is that he discovers or finds uh, the New World and connects the two hemispheres. This opens up trade between the two hemispheres that hadn't existed before. Another important thing to remember about Christopher Columbus is that he was not the first one to the New World. Other Europeans had gone there before. Many think, many historians think that the Vikings may have made several visits to the New World. However, he is given credit for discovering the New World. Another part of context is that the Silk Road is not as important to Europe as it used to be. Here are a couple reasons. One is that the trade with the New World, as well as Vasco da Gama finds a new route to India. He sails around the tip of Africa and finds out that he can get to India that way. And so this is important because this gives them another route to India. That way they can kind of skip the middleman of the Silk Road. Also, the Ottoman Empire conquers Constantinople. So now the Muslims are in control of what used to be Constantinople and now is called Istanbul. So the Silk Road is not as accessible to Europe as what it once was. We also have some new technological innovations. These are super important. The first one is called the Astrolabe. And this was first an Islamic development and then the Portuguese adapted it and created what's called the Mariner's Astrolabe. That was specifically designed to navigate in the ocean and to figure out latitude. So this is really going to help them as they travel. The other innovation that happened was the updates on map making, cartography. Cartography is basically a fancy term for map making. And remember that the Greeks used, uh, the Greeks were map makers as well. However, now the Europeans are going to expand on that and make maps a little bit more realistic and useful. Both of these things will enable for navigation of the seas a lot easier. We also have a ship called a caravel, and it is designed with this lateen sail. The lateen sail is important because it allows you to sail into the wind, and these ships are smaller and easier to navigate in and out of tight spaces. It also allows for carrying large cargo with smaller crews, which will decrease shipping costs. Another ship that's very important at this time is the Spanish Galleon. And this is a huge ship carry, uh, capable of carrying a very large cargo. It's used in the Spanish treasure fleet and also to transport slaves during the Middle Passage. Another thing that's important is that the Europeans are the first to arm their ships with cannons, giving them the power of the seas or enabling them really to dominate the seas. They're also going to learn how to use the currents to their advantage. That becomes super important because now, instead of the currents going against them, they can actually use them to travel faster. An example of this is Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama, he basically was trying to find a sea route to India, and he sailed almost to the coast of Brazil, where he caught the westerly currents, and that took him around the tip of Africa. So he's using the currents in his favor. Also, we have Prince Henry. He's going to be soon named the Navigator, and the reason is because he really, really wants to explore, and for he wants to do this for two reasons, mainly to convert natives to Christianity and to gain riches. So he begins to research and make as current maps as possible. He also designs the caravel, and Portugal becomes the leader of exploration because of his activities. Portuguese basically want to dominate the sea trade, but they weren't able to monopolize it completely. However, they were able to build a vast trading post empire. And what I mean by that is basically they had trading posts that merchants had to pay duties at their ports, 
and even purchase passports from them in order to sail through the area. And if a sailor was caught without a passport, it could be punished and cargo would be taken from them. Despite these grand ideas that the Portuguese had of ruling the seas, they really didn't have the manpower and able to do that. And so despite these rules, they weren't able to carry them out and several sailors ignored them and refused to pay. All right, so causes of exploration. We have three main causes of exploration that we see here. We call them the three Gs, glory, God, and gold. Glory is basically just fame for your country, nationalism, being able to say, we're the British and we're the biggest and the baddest, or we're the Portuguese and we're the biggest and the baddest. Like pride in your nation, that's basically what nationalism is. Also religion, duty to convert the natives to Christianity. Now notice that word duty. It is your Christian duty to convert these natives. Remember, most of the natives don't even speak English or or Spanish or Portuguese, and so to try to convert them and explain to them who God is, this is going to be a very difficult challenge. However, Europeans felt like it was their job to do this in order to help the natives and make them better. Gold, wealth for themselves and their country. So that's important, right? They wanna get as rich as possible off of the resources, specifically gold, that could be in these new areas. We have several different European countries that explore. One of them is the French, and this guy, Veranzano, he is the first to visit North Carolina. You see on the map here where he travels and explores. This voyage was in 1524. The French overall, their goal was to trade, not to colonize. As a result of this, they're going to respect the natives a little bit more because they want to trade with them, so they want to have a good relationship. Also, another note about the French is that they are mainly in the northern part of America once they start sending more traders over. Then we have the Spanish. First, we have Hernando Cortez. He leads his conquistadors. Conquistador is basically a fancy word for military, and he conquers the Aztecs. The Spanish are able to conquer the Aztecs because of three reasons. First, germs. So basically, the natives did not have immunity against the germs that the Europeans brought over. They're also able to conquer because of guns. And they also had help from the Aztec enemy. Remember, the Native Americans do not have guns either. And the reason that they're not immune is because they don't have domesticated animals the way that the Europeans do. Then we have Juan Ponce de Leon. He's a really interesting explorer. He basically is looking for the fountain of youth and he thinks that it's in what is modern day Florida. If you go to St. Augustine today, they have a special area designated to him and they say that you can go and see where the Fountain of Youth was, but he never actually found the Fountain of Youth. He did try though. The English were a little bit different in their goals of the New World and they wanted to set up colonies. Colony is basically land that is controlled by another nation. And we have Sir Walter Riley. He is someone that the English sent over to start colonies. One of those colonies was the Roanoke Colony. This would be in present day North Carolina. Colonists included women and children because remember they're going to try to stay. John White led that colony. They were running out of supplies and so he returned to England. However, he wasn't able to come back to the colonies. I think it was for two or three years. And when he returned, there was no one there. To this day, it's a mystery as to what happened to those colonists. No one really knows. However, it has been a theory for a long time that they might have went to the local Native American tribe and kind of mixed in with the Native Americans because some of the Native Americans later had blue eyes, which wouldn't have been in their DNA prior to the colonists. So it's kind of an interesting, one of those unsolved history mysteries. We also have Jamestown. Jamestown settles in 1606. 
they will trade with the Native Americans. They're led by John Smith. This is also where we have the Pocahontas story. And sorry to tell you, but the Disney version is not true. So uh, she was only 12 or 13 when John Smith arrived. So they did not fall in love. However, they could have been friends. One, once again, that's kind of another history mystery no one really knows. But it's an interesting story. And Jamestown is going to grow tobacco. That's one of their important cash crops, which we'll talk about here in a minute. So the differences between the Europeans, the English were the only ones who actually colonized. Therefore, they didn't treat the Native Americans very fairly because they're trying to take land from the Native Americans. The French were interested in trading, not colonizing, and the Spanish tried colonizing, but weren't successful. One issue with colonies is how to fund them. One way that they were funded was through joint stock companies. And basically that was where investors pooled their money together to pay for these ventures. What was good about it is that the profits were shared and the losses were also shared collectively. So if it failed, not one person went down with the ship. It was shared throughout all of the investors. And voyages were for profit, not for religion. That was another difference. Some examples of joint stock companies were the British East India Company. They had a monopoly of trade east of the Cape of Good Hope. And then the Dutch East Company, they're going to become very large because they had a lot more resources. They will eventually found New Amsterdam, which is New York City now. The Colombian Exchange is what is going to take place between the old world and the new world. Basically, here's what it looks like. We have all kinds of things coming from Europe, Africa, and Asia that did not exist in the new world before they came. For example, we have honeybees, sugarcane, bananas, so all kinds of food. Domesticated animals are very important because that's going to change the lifestyle of the Native Americans as well as diseases because that kills a lot of them. Now, if you have watched Germs, Guns, and Steel by Jared Diamond, which was in your reading questions this week, it is amazing. Like, his theory is just really interesting to me. Part of his theory is that the reason why the Europeans had immunity was because they had domesticated animals, so they had experience with all of these diseases, whereas the Native Americans didn't have that, and so they didn't have these diseases, and that's why so many of them killed were killed. The Columbian Exchange also goes the opposite way in that all of these new foods as well as the turkey and um, pineapples and tobacco and tomatoes all, and potatoes, all of those are going to Europe. So there are going to be some changes on both sides due to the Columbian Exchange. One other thing that was going back and forth from the old world to the new world was the silver. Silver was coming from the new world and it's minted into what's called a peso de ocho. And that is a coin that was widely accepted and basically connected these trade systems. It was in huge demand throughout the European world as well as in Asia. One example is in Mughal, India. This is the Taj Mahal. We've talked about it before, so you should be aware of what it is. But basically, the Mughal Empire got so rich from the silver and from profits of trade that they used silver-funded profits in order to build the Taj Mahal. Also, I want you to take note that in North America, there were several Native American tribes present all throughout the continent, as well as in South America. So these Native Americans were spread out in tribes all over. Oftentimes we just talk about contact here because here and down in the Caribbean and um, in this area is where we mostly get the first contact, but eventually as French and Spanish spread out throughout the North America region, as well as South America, they're gonna come into contact with other Native Americans. So just keep in mind that there were Native Americans throughout the entire continent. It wasn't just on the coast. After Europeans arrive, 60 to 90% of Native Americans die, huge number. And that is mostly due to the fact that they did not have immunity to the diseases that the Europeans brought, as well as the fact that they don't have guns, so their technology cannot compete with the Europeans. We also have the Middle Passage. This happens because there's a huge demand for labor, especially once we start seeing cash crops come into play. 
The middle passage is the journey of slaves from Africa to the New World. So triangular trade kind of starts because they, the Europeans want to make as much profit as possible. And so basically a ship is never sailing empty. It comes from Europe, collects items in Africa, slaves and gold mostly, and it goes over to the West Indies, up to the North America, it picks up things there, it drops things off, and it goes back to Europe. This is a chart of the items that travel throughout this triangular trade. Basically, it's making sure that everything is as profitable as possible by never traveling with an empty ship. This, unfortunately, is what it looked like when they were bringing slaves over on the Middle Passage. You can see here that it's very crowded. They often had layers of people that were laying on top of each other. It was a very, very bad situation for the Africans who were being forced into slavery and brought over. This is also going to make Western Africa a very big deal as far as trade goes because that's where they would be picking up slaves. Now I'm going to show you real quick this interactive map. This basically shows the transport of slaves on the Middle Passage and you see up at the top the years. So this is back in the 1500s and you'll start seeing some dots going across. Those represent the slave ships. Down at the bottom you see a little chart and as the graphic continues you will see how it increases with the amount of slave ships that are coming out of Africa and they're mostly going to the Caribbean. The least is going to mainland North America which is kind of interesting because most of the time when we talk about the slave trade, we focus on the North American part of it. But a lot of the slaves are actually going to the Caribbean and a lot are going to Brazil. They will eventually sometimes be transported from the Caribbean up to North America as the demand increases for them. But look at that, isn't that crazy? By the 16, late 1600s, it's just ridiculous how many slave ships are coming over. And as you can also tell that most of the slave ships are coming off of the coast of Africa. That doesn't mean that interior Africans weren't affected because they were. They were just transported to the coast in order to be sold. And most of the time, they were sold by opposing African tribes, which is also very sad that Africans turned on their own. Now, during the American Revolution, you see that there are hardly any ships going in, and then after the American Revolution, there's more going into North America. Now it's really picking up feeding into Caribbean and Brazil as well. More going in uh, during the 1800s into North America as well. It just baffles me how many ships are coming. Now you also see some ships coming from the eastern edge of Africa as well. All right, so let's wrap this up. We have continuity from 1450 to 1750. Remember, continuity is something that stays the same during that time frame, and um, one continuity would be the slave trade. So that's going to continue from during this time frame. Now, it doesn't really start in the New World until around the 1500s, a little bit later in the 1500s. However, the slave trade had been happening before the New World was founded. So you could talk about how the slave trade was traditional in the Roman Empire and then talk about how slaves were traded on the Trans-Saharan trade route as well and then talk about how it spreads to the New World. That would show continuity.
The other change that we have is, of course, diseases to the Native Americans. And if you watch Jared Diamond's Germs, Guns, and Steel, you know that the Natives had no immunity because they didn't have domesticated animals. Europeans pretty much lived with their domesticated animals, and from the domesticated animals, they got diseases and germs, and they were able to also get immunity for that reason. Natives didn't have that advantage, and so that is why so many of them died from the diseases that were brought over. Also, we have new plants coming. These new plants are bringing new insects. One of those new insects is the honeybee. This is going to change the environment, and that is a big change in the new world. There's an article called America Lost and Found that explains this phenomenally. You should read it if you haven't already, and I put the link in the comments below for you so that you could do that because this is some great evidence if you were ever writing an essay about this. Very good details about how insects can change the environment so much. We also have the change of deforestation, and this happens because they need the land for crops and huge plantations eventually once they start planting more cash crops. They also need the wood for shipbuilding because now shipping is a lot more profitable, and so they have this vast array of wood in the new world, huge resource for them in the old world. This is going to also change the environment though, and cause a, a lot of problems for the Native Americans. Also, Native Americans really don't look at land as being owned the way that the Europeans do, and so they're going to have conflicts over that as well. Horses are a big change to the New World. They did not have horses before the Europeans came, and this is going to basically change the entire culture of the Plains Natives because it increases the efficiency of hunting as well as fighting. All the animals that were brought are also going to multiply very quickly because there are no fenced in areas like there are in Europe. The Native Americans, once again, don't look at land as being owned and so they don't have fences and constricting the animals in any way and that's why they're going to multiply very fast. It also allows for new meats and the use of animal hides by the natives. So not all the changes are bad, some are good, but the majority of the ones to the Native Americans, the majority of the effects from the Europeans on the Native Americans are negative. However, horses would be one positive because it's going to allow the Plains Native Americans to hunt buffalo. Their culture will basically thrive because of the items that they get from the buffalo. Now we have some changes in the old world. First, there's new food, so that increases nutrition. Potatoes spread to Europe, enable for a surplus of food. China is even going to experience a population growth because of the potato. Also, cash crops spread to the old world. Tobacco is one example, it's super popular in Europe. As a matter of fact, there was a time when Jamestown was so focused on growing tobacco that they didn't grow food and they wanted the Native Americans to supply that food for them so that they could grow tobacco and spend their time trying to make money. But uh, that's going to be a problem and an area of tension between them and the Native Americans because of course the Native Americans don't think that they should have to provide the food for Jamestown. Sugar is another cash crop. The Portuguese are actually going to introduce the plantation system in Brazil. This is one of the reasons why slaves were so needed in Brazil and why you saw on that map so many of them going into Brazil. Soon it was discovered that rum could be made from sugar as well, which made it even more profitable and increased the demand for slaves, which is why the slaves are continually going into Brazil. We also have changes concerning religions. So remember Protestant Reformation, this happens in Europe. This is going to cause tension between Catholics and Protestants and Puritans especially. Puritans were being persecuted and so they, some of them, that is, sought safety in the New World. Puritans are Protestants. They're just a very pure form of that. And so the Puritans are the ones that come over to the New World seeking that refuge. Also, we have some syncretism going on in the New World, Christianity mixing with Native beliefs. This is one of those examples. This is the Virgin of Guadalupe. She's the patron saint of Mexico today, 
and in 1531, there were peasant reports of seeing a vision of the Virgin Mary at the site of an old Aztec temple. The Spanish had destroyed this temple earlier on, and they built a Catholic church in its place. So when the vision of Mary was unveiled to the people, the people identified her as the old Aztec god, and they started chanting his name. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it. I think it's Tenatzin. And basically, they identified him with her because there were flowers at her feet, and he was surrounded with flowers. And so that's a one example of syncretism in the New World. Another example is happening in the Caribbean where voodoo exists, and voodoo is basically the Catholic beliefs mixed with African beliefs. Now, remember at this time, this is also when gunpowder empires are expanding. So we talked about gunpowder empires, the last unit. This is not happening after that. This is happening at the same time. It's in the same time frame, okay? So please remember that when you do your timeline here in a little bit uh, for your final review, you'll be able to see how all of these things are kind of playing out at the same time frame. All right, as always, if you have any questions, please email me at missjziggler at gmail.com. And as always, if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss a thing. And that's it for today. See you next time.